How delightful to be with you here in Louisville at the Festival of Fays and to be with this distinguished panel of presenters. And I have the pleasure of introducing them and to ask you to hold your applause. And many of you have the biographical statements in your program, but it's good for the streaming audience. We have both an inside group and an outside group with us today. The first presenter is Mary Evelyn Tucker co-founder and co-director of the Forum on Religion and Ecology at Yale University. She teaches in the Joint Master's Program in Religion and Ecology at Yale between the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies and the Department of Religious Studies. She is the author and uh, or editor of close to 20 volumes and has published hundreds of articles. She is widely regarded as a pioneer in the field of religion and ecology. Now, I didn't write that, but <laughs> I'm very proud, of course, of my wife in this. I, I might add she's a scholar of Confucianism, just to give some specificity. In the presentation order, then, I have uh, Dr. Naweed Syed. Is that correct? Good, everyone. Uh, Dr. Naweed uh, is a specialist in the field of biomedical engineering and member of the medicine faculty at the University of Calgary. He became the first scientist to manage to connect brain cells to a silicon chip. This discovery, brain on a chip, is a major step in the research of integrating computers with human brains to help people control artificial limb, monitor people's vital signs, correct memory loss or impaired vision, Dr. Syed is a professor and scientific director of the Alberta Children's Hospital Research Institute, Cummings School of Medicine, University of Calgary. He obtained his master's degree from the University of Karachi, Pakistan in 1984, and his PhD in neurophysiology from the University of Leeds in England. After postdoctoral training at the University of Calgary, he was subsequently appointed as an assistant professor in the Faculty of Medicine. Dr. Saeed has served as research director for the Hodgkiss Brain Institute. Thank you for taking on double duties from yesterday too, Dr. Naheed. <coughs> Carolyn Finney, I'm so glad you're here with us after travel. <laughs> <laughs> a storyteller, author, and a cultural geographer. She is deeply interested in issues related to identity, difference, creativity, and resilience. Dr. Finney is grounded in both artistic and intellectual ways of knowing, a crucial topic for us today, ways of knowing. She pursued an acting career for 11 years, but five years of backpacking, <laughs> trips through Africa and Asia, and living in Nepal changed the course of her life. Motivated by these experiences, Carolyn returned to school after a 15-year absence to complete a BA, MA a degree on gender and environmental issues in Kenya and Nepal, and a PhD. She served on the U.S. National Parks Advisory Board for eight years. Her first book, Black Faces, White Spaces, Reimagining the Relationship of African Americans to the Great Outdoors was released in 2014. It was a wonderful contribution. Thank, Thank you. you for saying that. <laughs> that was nice. <laughs> Woman stands shining. It's so good to be with you. Wayakpa Najinwin is a Diné Navajo mother, grandmother, activist, artist, writer, ceremonial leader, and international speaker. She is a voice for global peace. And her paintings are created as tools for individual earth and global healing. She draws upon the deep indigenous sciences of thriving life to reframe questions about sustainability and balance. She is devoted to supporting the next generations. She was a speaker at the 2018 Festival of Faith, and there's no doubt uh, your return is a signal of how you reached people at that time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Shining woman standing. Mary Evelyn, you're our first presenter. Okay. Thank you. I'm very humbled to be with this amazing panel 
and I congratulate the organizers on the magnificent diversity represented here. And I want to, of course, give a special prayer for the indigenous peoples of this land all across the nation um, that we honor in special ways uh, at this conference. But I also want to thank Christy Brown for her vision in founding this, for Owsley Brown in carrying it forward, and for our wonderful hosts, Jim and Marianne Welch. And there's so many of you all on this staff. I have been immensely impressed with your generosity, your commitment. Let's give it up for those who must be very tired today, the staff. <laughs> So we're talking about this big word cosmology, but the way I like to think of it is just we're living within a universe story. Somehow people have done this for ages, but we're doing it again in a new way. That's the invitation here. So we need stories, clearly. It's what orients humans to the cosmos, grounds them to the earth. It motivates and inspires us. It awakens our imagination. It moves us to action and it gives us a sense of our place and role. And clearly yesterday with the panel on depression, that's one of the things, where is our role? Where's our place? We've had creation stories, of course, throughout human history. And this is represented in art. This is our Genesis story in the West for all the Abrahamic traditions, actually. But indigenous peoples have had their stories, their origin stories, the Hopi coming out of the Kiva, coming out of the ground and the earth um, to this earth. The Shinto creation myth is hugely important in Japan. You know, there was just a change of emperors and all of this comes back to the creation story of Amaterasu, the sun goddess, and the emperor until the Second World War was considered divine because of this creation myth, the Shinto myth. Now this changed, didn't it? Uh, with Charles Darwin and his origin of species, and we're still trying to get our minds around this. It's only 150 years old, that we're not just in a cosmos, but we're in cosmogenesis. Things are changing. That's a different thing. Of course, again, creation stories understood it, but in a very special way, through science, we're understanding it now. This magnificent 50-year-old photograph, December 68, also changed our vision. We're part of a solar system and a cosmos, Earth rise. Now, 10 years after that picture, Thomas Berry said, we need a new story that brings together science and religion, a story of evolution with awe, wonder, beauty, a functional cosmology that dynamizes human energy for the changes that we need, and this broader values and ethics that I'll be speaking about. So here is Barry, who passed away 10 years ago, a great inspiration to many people. He and Brian Swim did this book in 92, the first telling of a science and religion uh, news story. And with Brian, I did this Journey of the Universe uh, book. It's been translated into many languages, European and Asian. Um, and also this film, which some of you have had a chance to see, and we'd love to make it available to anyone who wants to use it for your family, your friends, your institutions. Um, that's been on PBS here in the States. I was on Netflix, available on Amazon Prime, and around the world. You know, it's very interesting. This is about evolution. And we never had a problem on PBS for three years. It's kind of amazing. Evolution with a spiritual twist. <laughs> I think we're making some progress, actually. <laughs> Um, but we also have these conversations, which we'd love to have you use, which are just about 20 minute interviews with scientists who are really empowered to tell us their part of this story, as well as environmentalists, which include things like eco-cities, eco-economics, how can we take this great story for the great work? And we've um, drawn on our wonderful colleagues of African-Americans, indigenous peoples, and Latina in these interviews. So here's our context. We like to think of it as deep time, a 14 billion year evolutionary story. And we're right in this awareness of evolution and its beauty and complexity, as well as extinction, loss, which is partly why people feel so sad, alone, not belonging. So we've got beauty and destruction interwoven, which has been the case throughout this 14 billion year process, by the way. 
We have these ecological social challenges, which the sad, bad news is overwhelming for people. But I do think climate change, we're moving towards eco-justice, biodiversity loss, we're moving towards restoration processes and things like biomimicry, as we heard yesterday, from pollution and toxicity to concern for food security, especially for our children, from consumerism to how can we live simply. All of this is about changing the dream of progress. Barry's idea was we need a new dream, the dream of the earth itself. So this is the age of the human, human-induced change all around the planet. Uh, so we're moving, as Barry liked to say, from a Cenozoic era, 65 million years ago, when the dinosaurs went extinct, to an Ecozoic era. Now, against all odds, and there's lots of bad mood, news, but what I'm trying to hopefully illustrate here is this move is being birthed and birth is difficult. So we're in a sixth extinction period. We are losing species, there's no question. But we're also awakening to this new intimacy of being part of a universe and earth community. We are stardust, and Carl Sagan said that so beautifully years ago. Um, so if we say we've come from the birth of stars, from a supernova, all the elements of our body. It's extraordinary, all the elements which have uh, generated life came from star uh, burst. So 10 billion years of universe evolution to eventually produce the unfolding of Earth and its systems. But that took as well 4.6 billion years to bring forth water and these life systems. The first cell on this planet was one billion years. One billion years before this first cell emerged and another billion years for multicellular life to emerge. Extraordinary. So then we have this explosion of plants, the diversity. This Louisville area right now is just singing, isn't it? With spring and its plants and flowers and trees. And the animals, oh, such incredible diversity, and as we know, they are also at risk. Um, and our human community around the world that has birthed our different societies and cultures, and a festival like this is celebrating that great diversity. So we know we're in a great transition moment, or as Johanna Macy talks about it, the great turning. So this sense of a breakdown to break through is where we are right now. Now we're living within this story. I'm gonna say it's a, we wanna make it a functional cosmology, an epic story, inspiring the great work, some of which we've heard about here, biomimicry yesterday, the organic farming movement. It's a living cosmology that's integrating this story for the transition. And again, the renewable energies that are bursting forth and the healing processes from indigenous traditions, from traditions around the world um, to give us the energy to make this transition. Now, here's what I would suggest is one of our greatest obstacles, that the enlightenment period from the French Revolution forward has given us life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, very individualistic, right? Um, but we need now this sense of the interconnectedness of all life. So ecology and the community of life is giving us interdependence, relationality, flourishing. And human connections to all of this are arising in new ways. So new values are emerging. Life is interdependence of all species. Liberty is relationality, kinship, all my relations, as the Lakota say. Happiness is living in a flourishing earth community with wellness, well-being. And we're moving, despite all odds, and in, amidst crashing conflicts, but we are moving from the nation state to a multicultural planetary civilization. One of the evidences is this from a declaration of independence to one of interdependence, which is the Earth Charter, which was birthed over almost 10 years, an amazing process around the world from the Rio Earth Summit. The preamble talks about a cosmology of this vast unfolding universe, but indigenous peoples on that drafting committee contributed this notion, we are 
Earth, our home, is alive. And they were weeping in 1972 when we were all there in Rio for the fifth uh, anniversary of Rio. And Gorbachev held up this declaration and indigenous people said, our worldview is in this declaration of interdependence. Which brings together ecology, ecological integrity, justice, and peace, an integrated worldview. So does the papal encyclical, this integrated ecology that he's calling for. So liberty in that encyclical is relationality, bringing together social justice and ecological ethics for eco-justice. And we have especially an explosion right now of grassroots movements for interdependence. The climate change march in New York, but Shell no along the Pacific Northwest, and they stopped that effort of Shell, amazing. And here, you know, we have to give it up one more time for these amazing young people, the Extinction Rebellion in the UK, Sunrise Movement here, Green New Deal, our Children's Trust, and Greta Thunberg. Can we give it up for interdependence? <laughs> this is so hopeful, it is so hopeful. So, just to conclude then, our ethical responsibility, what is it? This festival is embodying it in so many powerful ways. But we're widening our sense, aren't we, of care for humans and for the earth. We're broadening our participation in the whole so that awe evokes action, reverence inspires responsibility, and we have an ethics for the common good. And I'm going to end, as I do often, with the same beautiful quote that Owsley Brown began us with on Wednesday night from Einstein. A human being is part of a whole called by us universe, a part limited in time and space. He or she experiences himself, his thoughts and feelings as something separated from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of his consciousness. This delusion is a kind of prison for us, restricting us to our personal desires and to affection for a few persons nearest to us. Our task must be to free ourselves from this prison by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature in its beauty. Let's give it up for Albert Einstein. <laughs> Thank you. No, no, no. Thank you. They were screwed. Thank you, Mary Evelyn, for such a and both enthusiastic and a sweeping overview of uh, our responsibility and our commitments in this regard. Before I have occasion to ask our panelists for some interaction regarding Mary Evelyn's remarks, let me open with this uh, question. Your uh, opening of this panel on wonder and awe, a conversation on cosmology and worldviews, suggests that we, in our contemporary phase and in all of our diversity and different cultures, are encountering some very old questions about the, the micro-individual, the microcosm of the person and the macrocosm expressed in, in so many different ways in, in cultural depth and profundity. So this micro-macro interaction seems to be at the heart of your remarks, and yet at, oh, early on you mentioned the sense of dream or changing the dream. Is it possible to say something about this forward-looking dream that is itself calling us, or almost a new way of knowing that calls it into these new configurations? Well, thank you for that question. Um, it's really at the heart of a lot of things I think we're all thinking about. And that is, the human isn't isolated, clearly. John Donne said that. But what does it mean then to expand our identity? Like the Confucian worldview is the individual is completely related to the other, to family, to society, to the educational system, political system, nature, and the cosmos. It's impossible to live without all of these concentric circles. And like a pebble in the pond, that's the fundamental relationality, deeply connected to, and no doubt influenced by, indigenous traditions. So the notion, even in Confucianism, is 
we have to cultivate ourselves in relation to all of these other groups so that our sense of, of being human is extended way beyond our own self and therefore we contribute to a common good. We can do this through our imagination. It's what indigenous traditions have helped us to do. We can do it through healing practices, prayer, etc. But we can do it also through action for future generations. And that's what the religious traditions have done. That's what telling a story, like a journey story, can also do for us. Thank you. May I invite any uh, comments or questions? So I think I really love your narrative as well. Um, I think at the end of the day, as you said, action is really needed because I think we need to have a sense of ownership, mm -hmm. a sense of belonging as well as sense of ownership. And I think the issue really often comes uh, about is that uh, for environment, for our human values, our common human spirit, I think it's the sense of ownership is important because nobody washes a rental car. Mm -hmm. And if people don't really <laughs> own it, I think it's really important that we have that sense of ownership, but hope is never a good strategy. I think we can hope that the government and other people will really come together, but I think the most important thing is that all the great people in this room and also who are really working very hard to change the world, we may be tiny little snowflakes, but you put it together, it becomes an avalanche. I wanna sort of, the idea that we have to take ownership, which I agree, but it, for me that also means we have to take responsibility. Right. And this is often the place that's really hard because as human beings, I don't, want to, I don't want to take responsibility for the things I don't like, but I have to do that. And what does that look like? How do we do that? How do we move forward? There's more mm -hmm. I can say about that. Though. Well, you know, what's coming to mind for me is in my own community, well, and, and really at Standing Rock. Standing Rock mm -hmm. was yes. a very clear example of a lot of elements that had never really come before in that way on the planet, or I don't know if I can say on the planet, but not in, in recent memory. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and I know at home, you know, I think yesterday I mentioned that we have this water issue going on where they want to drill these 14 deep aquifer wells in this 20 mile square area. Um, and this is gonna keep coming up. And so what the young people in my community who are at Standing Rock learned was that um, there's no way for one person to address that. Um, you know, our, our, our systems are not set up right now for life, frankly. They're set up for, with, a, with, a pri with other priorities. Mm -hmm. And so as we begin to notice what's happening to our life, we have to keep uh, pressing up against these systems that are not really equipped to deal with what's, what's, what's occurring around us. And really that's gonna take, all, it's gonna over and over again, it's gonna take masses of people saying, hey, um, this looks like we're heading off the cliff and you know, what do we do? So, so, uh, so that community you know, is, is, is critical. And what I'm watching in my home is just, it's, it's so amazing. Since I've been here, um, everybody got very tired um, and people were starting to disband and they, you know, I was getting all the email, the, the text threads of them saying, let's have a cookout tonight, let's go all soak in the springs and remember what we're doing. And um, so not only is it, has it been like this, you know, the, the, the old activists, everybody coming together, but, but it's really recreating family in the most powerful way mm -hmm. and bringing together all factions of the community for, for life. We mm -hmm. all need the water. Yeah. Sure. Life calls us forward, but it calls us forward with this sense of communal responsibility uh, and for engagement that finds uh, feet on the ground and hands reaching out to take hold of the work. Uh, is there a further comment, Mary Evelyn, you'd like to make? Well, that? these were all terrific, and I just really wanted to pick up on the last one because that slide's gonna go in the next <laughs> version of this, because I think Standing Rock is the most remarkable Good. example of this, yes, really, incredible, incredible. And everyone was watching it, right, who cares about these issues, because water is life, was central to it. And young people and doing the rituals and keeping the fire going, that was central to it. And it attracted, of course, people from all over the world, indigenous people, but more than. Mm -hmm. And to me, it was one of the signal moments of our time 
of the power of the earth calling us forward to say water is sacred, life is sacred. So thank you for really bringing that into our conversation. Excellent, excellent start. Dr. Nawid Said, may I invite you to the podium? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's really honor and privilege to be here. I think these maybe a couple of days have been some of the best uh, of my life. I think I met so many great, wonderful people and also fell in love with your town. So thank you for being so hospitable and so wonderful. Uh, and my apologies if I scared some people about the artificial intelligence and machine learning. <laughs> And I think I was approached by so many people, they dropped their lunches and coffees and they were chasing me around, finding out. <laughs> but today actually I'm going to reconnect back to my roots and I think I will take you back to my own personal stories. And I grew up in Pakistan and my family originally had our land right on the border of India and Pakistan and it was Samana and Patiala state. And after partition, which was really terrible and very hurtful and many people got killed, we acquired the land which was on this side of the border and this is where we grew up. And growing up, um, my family was very well off and we have many Christians living in our neighborhood. And often those Christians were very poor and uh, we had the tradition that um, unlike the slackers here in North America, the back home Christians actually fasted 40 days so I would fast with them 10 days and then the 30 days with the rest of the Muslims. So we were really that close, but they were really poor and often they will come um, for help to my father who always stepped up and helped them provided funding for the church. And one day they came and being a young kid, I always watched these conversa conversations and they said to my father, our church bell has broken down again. Um, you generously supported us, but it no longer works. Uh, can you help? So my father said, how much is going to cost to fix this? And they said, what, 30,000 rupees? And that was a lot of money. So my father said, what if we buy a new one? And he says, there's no way we can afford. So he said, well, here's a check. Let's go and buy a new one. And then he called his sons and asked us to go and collect that bell. And I thought, well, father is really clever. He's going to sell this bell and get some copper, some money out of it. So it's a good business deal. So we went happily and, and collected that bell, brought it back. It was the afternoon. He was pacing in the lawn. He says, do you have it, son? Yes, father. Where is it? It's on the truck. He says, go and take it. I just bought a piece of land and I'd like you to bury this bell in that land. And it was kind of shock. But of course, I knew that if I asked the question, uh, somebody going to get hurt real bad. <laughs> so um, quietly we went along. It was May 21st, a hot day, and sun was scorching um, hot, and there were these people digging up a big hole. So we stood there for four or five hours, and remember, it's the shoveling, right? So they shoveled, hand shoveled. The bell was eventually buried, came home, and the sun was setting down. And my father is still pacing. He says, well, what happened to the bell? I said, Dad, we buried it. He says, did you bury it properly? He says, well, Dad, it's a bell. We dug a hole and we put it there and we covered it up. He said, sit down. <laughs> sit down. And I thought, uh-oh, somebody going to get hurt. <laughs> and at that time, there was the call for prayers from mosque. And he said, who is calling for prayers? I said, it's Muazzin. It's the mullah. And he said, so he's calling people to come to mosque. What will happen if he dies? I said, we, we'll wash his body, we'll give him you know, um, proper burial, we'll bury him in the grave. And he said, oh, you will do this to your muazzin or your mullah, because he calls people to mosque. You know, Christians used to ring this bell to call people to come to church. Their mullah just died. And it deserved the same reverence and respect as your own mullah would. The father is actually buried next to that bell. So that really taught me uh, something very important in my life. The purpose of life is actually life lived with a purpose. And the purpose is to serve humanity. 
when I started reading Quran, the only place where the word Muslim was described was a service to humanity. That's it. So I think, you know, um, that really set the stage, but he was also wise. He said, you know, go and every Friday go to, to mosque and Saturday you're going to go to synagogue and Sunday you're going to go to church. So in Karachi, we used to have a small little uh, synagogue. Only 200 families really lived there at that time. They have moved uh, out since then. And we will actually go and learn different things. And when I went to mosque, I learned uh, something very important. And I think, you know, as one of the topics that we have today is that how do material and immaterial things, they define us. And I quote one of the sayings of Imam Ali, who was the um, cousin as well as son-in-law of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And he said that it is not that you do not possess any this in, anything in this world, but nothing worldly should possess you. And he used to say that you are like a boat that floats in water. And this world is that water. Could be ocean, could be river. For as long as this water stays out of your boat, you will continue to float. The moment you started collecting worldly desires and worldly things into your boat, it will slow you down and eventually sink you. And I think those are the really the defining moments when you go to mosque or, you know, the places of worship and church. So I wanted to ask myself, what does really life mean? And what do I learn about life from the mosque? And I realized the Quran describes very explicitly what life and death is. It says that the earth was dead. And then after putting water into it from the skies, we made it come alive. And then he would say that, look at the trees during winter times. They are actually dead. There are no butterflies fluttering their wings. There are no bees hovering around. There are no birds nesting, no fruits, no flower. The tree will be deemed as dead. And then when we looked at flowers, the flower withers away, the scent is gone, and the petals fall. That flower is dead. So actually, I learned a very important lesson and that is that we have all been endowed with unique capabilities and unique abilities. To take those abilities, to make them uh, really work and bring them into action, is this is what life is all about. So I think rather than you know, creating a concept of that you have to worship because we worship God because he's worthy of worship. Not because of the fear of going to hell or uh, really the, the greed to get into heaven because he's worthy of worship. So I think from uh, that point onwards, when I learned the meanings, and then I asked when I used to go to a synagogue or my Jewish friends, I learned that our bodies are like Torah scrolls. They both contain the living words of our living God. As long as we live, that word can live in us. When we die, and then the spirit that carried the word departs from us, our bodies will still remain their sanctity. Like a worn out Torah scrolls, we bury them in the earth after we put them in casket or Aaron. As we lower our physical remains of the loved ones into earth, we are asked to take up spiritual legacy and make it our own. In the church I learned, Jeremy 32, 19, the great are your purposes and mighty are your deeds. Your eyes are open to the ways of all mankind. You reward each person according to their conduct and their deeds deserve. Also from the Buddhist traditions I learned from Buddha, the longest the cycle of birth and death to the fool who does not know true path. So I think at the end of the, all of this, I realized that all religions were teaching me the same thing. And of course, the Christians and Jews and Muslims are all cousins, they're children of Abraham. Mind you, Muslims are the only younger ones, that's why we're rowdy enough to control a bit. <laughs> but you know, at the end of the day, I think I also view all of, um, you know, people in different faiths, especially, I think, uh, from the Islamic perspective, and I like to clear some concept that Islam means acceptance. And by accepting and endorsing Jesus Christ and Moses, um, God 
and the Quran lends enormous credibility through their prophecy and their teaching. Now, of course, these are the religions that were created by God. And if I am writing a scientific paper, would you expect me to reject that paper because I wrote it myself? How could God actually reject any of these faiths? And it says very, very clearly that don't clash with each other vis-a-vis -vis your God. He is our God and he is their God as well. He has come, he has same connection with us as he has with them. It's your actions and your actions are your actions and their actions are their actions. Quran did not say that Jews or Christians will anyway be punished. Quran says that you will find more closeness with Christians if they bend towards you in peace, you must reciprocate. So I think learning all of these things, I started to join the school. And of course, um, I was taught interesting stories and there was a, a religious class as well. And I come home one day and my mother said, what did you learn? in your school. I said, well, we learned about religion. She was very happy. And she said, what did you learn? I said, well, our teacher told us how Moses crossed Nile when his followers were with him and Pharaoh was chasing them. So she said, well, what did you learn? I said, well, I think what happened was that Moses with his followers, he first built a platoon bridge. So he was on the other side, then on his walkie-talkie, he talked to the headquarters and asked them to send some fighter jets. And there comes these two fighter jets with laser-guided missiles. They blew up the bridge and he was safe. So she looked at me completely bewildered. He said, you learn all this nonsense in your school? And I said, mom, I think it happened this way. If I tell you what my teacher said, you will never believe. So I think that was a shock and awe for me. It was, a, it was a, an eye opener and I really realized in school also that science is actually evidence based. It's experimentally driven with an end goal and it answers certain specific questions. You know, studying philosophy, um, I learned that no definitive answers are really looked. It's a very open ended. And it helps us prepare our mind for intelligence and the social and as well as emotional intelligence. And that helps us self-recognition as well as the recognition of the almighty powers, the, the great. And then I looked at the theory of evolution. I thought that, well, you know, it makes perfect sense, but I have never seen a, you know, a monkey comes out of the zoo and says, hey, I am your next politician, president, <laughs> or something like this. It hasn't happened. Yes, the process is slow. It could have taken billions of years, but for God's sake, a billion years ago, a monkey that's tried to convert must have showed up. So these are all naive questions. I said, I can't take 10 coins and I numbered them one to 10. The probability is really very, very rare that every, two, every time I will be able to pick up two of these coins at the same time. Then I thought about you know, the awe, um, and I'll tell you an interesting story is that I was really fascinated by these bees, and I will dug up a small little hole and stick my head into the hive, and they think that I was part of the hive, and often they will leave some honey on my nose. Um, but the idea was that you know, I thought they ha don't have GPS system, they go from place to place, collect flowers and nectar, but the honey tastes the same at the end. And who has taught them this remarkable engineering uh, principles to construct this hive, which is masterpiece. So I think all, each and everything that you looked around was really awe. Um, and I said, okay, if the evolution really persists, but what about things, um, the galaxies? How is it possible the Earth, if it was even a few millimeter larger than it is, it would not have been able to sustain its environment? And the, the, the rotation, if it is actually one hundredth of a second slower or faster, everything will topple. So even if you can think that the animals have evolved, how could this actually entire universe will be put together? Um, then I looked at the theory of light and I said, we don't even know what the speed of light really is. We just calculated roughly. The string theory didn't make much sense to me. And then I think everything turns out is that it's just a black hole. So you know, you think, <laughs> 
we only have 0.03% of knowledge from science and physics. Anybody who tells me that physics explain everything, I think that really is, um, it turns out to be, again, another hoax, hoax for me. And so I think, you know, coming down to, um, uh, somebody asked that if anything exists like the God's concept, if it exists, how come my senses do not conceptualize it? And it turns out that, you know, why is it that if I can't see a God, I can feel God, I can touch God, and then it reminds me of the great-grandson of Prophet Muhammad, uh, peace be upon him, is Imam Jafar Sadiq. He's the sixth Imam of the Shia um, faith. And then he was asked the same question, and he said to this person, do you know that the blood actually circulates in your body? This is almost 1,200 years ago. Blood circulates in your body like a circuit. Do you ever see it? Do you feel it? He says, no. He said, do you know there are small, tiny little particles in your body? He's referring to cells. They are born and die in your, in your body, and um, they are more than the sand particles on the sand. Do you see them? Do you realize them? Do you recognize them? And he said that even this, the statue that you worship, do you know that there is still movement in this? So I think, you know, um, all of these things that our senses cannot conceptualize, we really um, believe that that great being or the entity is out there that is a smart design that has allowed us, given us the wisdom to be able to really discover it. So the creation, the purpose of creation of human beings is for us to recognize God and to, um, so that he could be discovered. And I think all these religions and faiths brings it all to the same level whereby we are, we are able to really reach out and even think. So I think, and I tell my atheist friends that if it turns out that there is no God, nothing will happen to me, but somebody gonna get hurt real bad. <laughs> So I think when you also see scientific experiments, they are actually done in the holy book, in the Quran, the birth of Christ um, itself, you know, is the first experiment of human cloning. Prophet Solomon, actually, um, Prophet Solomon, uh, he's, you know, he would say that anybody can bring the actual, um, you know, the, the, the pulpit of Queen of Sheba in a, in a blink of an eye, that's actually Star Trek stories. So everything that in the modern sciences is actually has been, and the idea is to really open your mind to think. And I think the religion and science, this is where they come together. They allow you to ponder and be awed and be actually excited. So and in closing, I would like to really say that um, I can write the best essay. And one of the reporter asked me that, you know, uh, you've got very strong faith about science as well as religion. I said, I can write the best manuscript, I can write the best paper, um, um, but if you take this light off, I cannot actually read my own paper, my own writing, my own intellectual contributions. So my faith is that light that provides true meaning to my knowledge. Thank you very much. Naweed, thank you very much for taking us through uh, a glimpse of your personal life story and bringing it to bear upon this panel on wonder and awe. And uh, I'm inclined to add another term to the introductory character of the panel, wonder and awe and humor, <laughs> or more directly, laughter. And I wanted to pursue that with you as a question before you all intervene. I sense that uh, humor is an interesting rhetorical device, and I know you're a skillful speaker, and you can uh, move your audience to relax and then engage what it is that you're saying, but I sense as a physician and a healer that humor is something more than simply a rhetorical device. Could you say, uh, address that or speak a bit more? I think it's a, it's a great question. And I really think that we, one of the most important thing that we all have to do from the religious perspective, we need to really learn to laugh at ourselves. So I think, you know, just laugh at yourself and the other people become really relaxed as well. But it also really provides the, um, you know, it uh, the, makes the conversation a lot easier. I think Carolyn is going to mention, as soon as she mentioned, you know, of race, everybody's tentacles wow. go up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I think we need to really be able to, uh, to uh, you know, make laugh and, and uh, relax ourselves. I think the sense of humor, 
Um, I will cite the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Imam, Imam Ali said many times, I have never seen anyone smile so much than the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon Excellent. him. Excellent. Excellent. That's Please. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I, how do you get, I'm always thinking about how do you get people to lean into a conversation that's hard? To lean. You know, how do you get them to lean in? What's really, you know, we talk, for me, I talk a lot and think a lot about our common humanity as well, like everybody else is here. And I believe we can't get there unless we deal with the hard stuff. It has to be authentic, it has to be real, right? I'm interested in reconciliation and redemption. How do you get people, when I look at people and I say, I'm gonna to talk to you about race, which I'm gonna do in about a minute, <laughs> right? <laughs> At, right, and how do I get you to not shut down and say, well, you know, I can laugh at it too. I can laugh, because I'm a human being. We are funny. Mm -hmm. We kind of crazy. Mm -hmm. We kind of a lot of things, right? So for, me, so for me, humor is really powerful and it's accessible to everyone, right? Mm. I'll stop talking. And sometimes, please. Mm -hmm. Well, us native folks are very stoic. <laughs> very stoic. <laughs> no, we, we laugh a lot. Huh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> we laugh and laugh and laugh. Um, but I think the other, the other piece uh, that is emerging, certainly for me, but I think in general, at, because of where we perceive ourselves to be, is, is vulnerability. Yes. Mm -hmm. To be able to express vulnerability um, is a great unifying uh, peace that uh, hopefully we can begin to cultivate in the good ways. Um, vulnerability versus um, uh, forcing another human being to be your therapist on the spot. Uh, <laughs> but vulnerability is, is so powerful for us yeah. in this connection. I, I love that. Thank you all. And I just want to say being vulnerable. So I'm married to this guy, we teach together, and the best thing is his sense of humor. Um, and especially when we teach, because students are kind of like just watching two people teach together, but he will always laugh, he makes us all laugh, and um, it, it makes the class just uh, rise up. So clearly humor is fantastic, but when you have a partner who has a great sense of humor, it's all to the good. Thank you, John. Yeah. Good work, Mary Eva. Well, this stern... <laughs> <laughs> this stern academic has the task of moving things forward, but I'm struck by how all of us here participate in where Naweed has, uh, has spoken about the world as giving and seeing it within the traditions. And we talk about philanthropy as a human act, but I'm hearing in all of you an understanding of uh, a philanthropy of life. Mm -hmm. We live in this giving world, and yet to simply take it for granted misses our responsibility, this call that we all have also to be responsible. And Carolyn, I know your responsibility is very deep, <laughs> and it walks across that tightrope of uh, storytelling. So may I invite you to... Uh, no. Take us forward. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, thanks. So I really want to be out here where you are, but I'm going to really try to stay in my time and, and move around and then not really listen to myself and do what I want anyway. You know how that goes. Um, so I just got here, right? I was thinking, I was, I was literally at the mountaintop yesterday because I was in Breckenridge, Colorado, so I've missed what you've all been talking about. I want to thank everybody at the Festival of Faiths for inviting me here. This is my first time. I've been living in Kentucky for about three and a half years in Lexington, and this is only like my second time in Louisville. Louisville, is that the way you're supposed to say it? Yeah, you can tell I'm not from here. Um, so I'm really excited to be here and be part of the conversation. Um, so, wow, I wrote some things. So some thoughts and some stories, and that's kind of where I'm gonna go here, right? Um, so I've been thinking about this question of purpose, and when people ask me, what do I believe in, it gets me really, and the issue of faith, actually, I'm really, I, I don't go to church, I'm kind of confused, right? So I'm just going to be honest with you, right? And actually, but when I get to it, what I believe in and what I have faith in is people. So I have to tell you a little bit about what I do, what I get privileged to do. Um, I tend to go, I'm coming out behind the table now. I tend to go around the country, uh, people ask me, it's often predominantly white groups that do all kinds of environmental work. So I know you've all been talking about the world and the issues and the environment and stuff that we have out there. They want me to come in and talk about race. And full disclosure, I'm black. 
diversity, inclusion, um, power, and privilege, things that are really hard. I don't think we're really good at it, at having a common conversation about what it means. So we talk about sustainability, we talk about protecting a river, we talk about protecting a forest, but really, what about our relationship to each other? For me, we can't do that work unless we get that right. So what does it mean for us to do that? Um, I tell people, you know, yeah, I can have an intellectual conversation with you about this, I can have a professional conversation, but this is personal. It's personal, it's political, it's intimate, and I think it really should be that way for everyone. So I have to go back, I almost forgot I had this in my hand, okay. Bam. I always have to tell a little bit of my own story as well, right, kind of to own where I started and how I got here in terms of thinking of purpose and faith. Um, I always tell people that I'm from New York. I've moved around a lot, but I will always be from New York. I usually get a little attitude about it as well when I tell people. Um, but I want to talk about my parents, actually. Rose and Henry, you're seeing their pictures up there. Uh, Rose and Henry grew up in Floyd, Virginia, high school education, poor. Um, like a lot of black people in the 30s and 40s, they moved north. After my, my dad fought in the Korean war, they decided to move north because they just weren't getting the kind of job opportunities. They weren't getting any opportunities, let me tell you, in the South. I can, there's a lot I can say about that. Uh, so my father came to New York and he got two job offers. One, he could be a janitor in Syracuse, New York, about five hours north of the city. He didn't take that job. The second one was 30 minutes outside of New York City. Very wealthy Jewish family owned a 12-acre estate. You're seeing the pictures there on the screen. And they also owned a lot of real estate within New York City as well. Uh, my father took that job. He was the gardener, the chauffeur. My mom was a sometime housekeeper. It was full-time living on that property in that house you see up in the corner. The Tishmans came up on the weekends and holidays. This is and was a very wealthy white neighborhood. Harry Winston has property down the street. Schaefer Beer lived next door. Wingfoot Golf Club is around the corner. We were the only family of color in that neighborhood until the 1990s when a Japanese American woman moved in. After a few years, she moved out. So my parents moved there in the late 50s. They tried to have children and they thought they couldn't, so they adopted me. And then what I always like to say is they relaxed and had my first brother and then they did some more relaxing and had my second brother. Uh, <laughs> Tishman's only came up on weekends and holidays, which meant my, me and my brothers had run to this place like our own private park. There's a pond, a swimming pool, vegetable gardens, fruit trees. It's a gorgeous piece of property. So my sense of non-human nature and my relationship to it was forged and I was privileged to have that relationship of having, of forging that relationship with nature um, day in and day out living on this property. But it's complicated because I can also tell you that when I was nine years old, I went to public school. I was walking home from school. I tell people I'm highly unimpressive with my little afro and my little reading glasses and my little school bag. There was always cops patrolling this area. I got around the corner from the house. A policeman stopped me. He wanted to know where I was going. I gave him the address, 1000 Old White Plains Road. He just looked at me and said, oh, do you work there? And I'm like, dude, I'm nine. <laughs> Except I don't say that. I just said, no, I, I live there. And so he let me go. And I remember going home and telling my parents, my father getting really mad and calling the police station. And the police never stopped me and my brothers again. But as an adult, that's complicated for me. Because I, all the clues were there. I was like a little girl. I was nine. I was coming home from school. What was it about the color of my skin that seemed unnatural for me to be there? So my love of the environment, my love of non-human nature was complicated by this idea that maybe I don't really belong. Maybe my family doesn't really belong, right? So let's jump ahead into the 90s. Both the Tishmans, one has died, the other is about to die. My parents have been caring for this land now full time for almost 40 years, right? Um, to her credit, she said she wanted to try to keep my parents on this land. Um, but she couldn't for many different reasons. Um, the property was worth $3 million. The property taxes were over $125,000 a year. My dad had been making about $20,000 a year. So instead she had a house built for them back in Virginia, in Leesburg, Virginia, a beautiful house um, on a half an acre of land. Mrs. Tishman passed away, my parents stayed on, the new owner came on. My parents stayed on until 2003. Now they've been caring for this land for nearly 50 years, full time. Um, they found a family from the Dominican Republic to move in and replace my parents. My parents then moved to their beautiful house in um, Virginia, and my father in particular proceeded to get incredibly depressed. And he talked about missing that land, missing that place. Um, 
um, and wanting to go back there but not being able to do that. They then received a, a copy of a letter from their neighbors. Um, a conservation um, land trust had decided to put a conservation easement on this piece of land, which means in perpetuity nothing can be changed. And it talked about all the environmental values of this piece of land, the wildlife where it sits in the watershed, all the reasons why this land should be protected. At the end of this letter, and I have a copy of it because I carry it around with me, it's about a page and a half long with some really nice pictures, it thanked the new owner for his conservation-mindedness. He'd been on it for three years. There was nothing in the letter thanking my parents who'd cared for it for 50 years. And that fast, my parents, my family became invisible. This is where it became incredibly personal for me. And I started thinking about the people around this country, particularly African American, but not only African American, who have been erased, who are invisible, who we don't think have anything to offer, who aren't, despite all the challenges that they face day in and day out, are resilient and are coming up with ideas, who have purpose, and who respect their life here and fight for their life here. So with that in mind, oh yeah, you know, this is kind of hard, but I'll put this up here just to say to you that for me, it's the complication about our history and our stories. There isn't one narrative. There are many narratives. So while I have uh, John Muir and, and President Roosevelt there in the middle thinking about national parks and all these wonderful things that they're thinking about, at the same time, native genocide is going on. At the same time, enslaved Africans have recently been freed, but Jim Crow was happening, so they're not allowed to move, move around. We've been doing this thing for 400, 500, hundred years, demonizing groups of people, shutting out other groups of people who don't look like us, and we're here at this point. A lot of the reasons for me why we're here aren't new, they are old. It is yet another opportunity for us to stop, take responsibility and ownership for it, and figure out how we can um, reconcile where we are and heal it in order to move forward. I wanted to give a couple of, uh, I call it convergence, that's right, beautiful. Um, I, so I started thinking about this idea of radical presence, and um, um, Dr. Syed and I were having a conversation earlier about this idea that I don't think anybody wants to be defined by their, the fact they've been victimized, which doesn't mean to say that it isn't important to acknowledge and be held accountable for victimization. But I was thinking about this in terms of African Americans, and particularly as it relates to nature and the environment, the idea that if you are able to stand strong and still think forwardly, for me that's a type of radical presence. I saw a show um, uh, in New York City, it was an art show uh, a number of years ago at the Studio Museum in Harlem, and it was African American artists had come together from the 1960s to now to think about how we tell story and how we create a story of ourself in place. And they called the show Radical Presence. And I decided to sort of borrow that idea to think about black people who show up over and over again, even if we erase them, even if we make them invisible, who have something to offer who we are. I think about Ron Fil Finley, who calls himself the gorilla gardener. You ain't gangsta unless you're planning something. He lives out in LA. He plants on highway medians. He doesn't wait for permission, because if he waited, he may never get it, because a lot of black people in this country have never been given permission, and he does it anyway. I think about Mavine Betch, and I got to meet Mavine is amazing. She's known as the beach woman, um, the beach lady. She grew up in a very wealthy black family off the coast of uh, Jacksonville, Florida on Amelia Island back in the 40s and 50s. Her great-grandfather, A.L. Lewis, was the first man black or white to have a life insurance company um, in Jacksonville, so it made a ton of money. But it didn't matter, because if you were black in the 40s and 50s, you couldn't go to the same beach as white people. So you know what he decided to do? He decided to buy a beach. He did. He named it American Beach. It was on Amelia Island. You could be a black janitor or a black judge. You could have a house on the beach. That's the sand dunes behind it. This is where Mavine grew up. She decided to go to Oberlin College. She decided she wanted to be an opera singer. She went to Germany. The point of the story that I want to tell you about her is sometime in the 70s, she became interested in environmental causes. When she came back to the United States, she gave all her wealth away to environmental causes, over $750,000. Her great-grandfather's house that had been bequeathed to her, she gave it away to environmental causes. Causes. This woman was, was living on a chaise lounge on the beach. I said to Mavine, weren't you scared? And Mavine said, no, I had a big stick. 
Maveen would tell me, because Amelia Island is this beautiful strip of beach between two other beach resorts with a beautiful maritime forest, you had developers you know, chomping at the bit to build another hotel, another golf course. Maveen would tell me she would go to civic meetings you know, where you could kind of discuss it if you were part of the public. And Maveen said, I would stand in the background like she wouldn't be noticed. That's all of Maveen's dreadlocks long she carries under her arm anyway. She said she'd stand in the back, they'd do the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge of allegiance to the flag, to the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice, and then she shot out at the top of her lungs, for all white people who got money, <laughs> and all. In the end, working with the National Park Service, they, they helped to protect 8.2 acres of the sand dunes. Um, and right before she passed away, was she passed away right after Hurricane Katrina hit, um, she said to me, I am the freest person you will ever meet. Because when I gave away the money, I was able to do exactly what it is I needed to do. I wanted to tell you about John Francis, um, another example of radical presence. John, if you haven't, if you haven't heard, you got to look up John Francis. John Francis in the 70s lived in Northern California. There was a small oil spill. He got upset by that oil spill. He decided he wasn't going to take any kind of motorized transport. He said that after a week, he was always getting into arguments with friends and family about the fact that he wouldn't get in their car. So he said, well, I'm just not going to talk to them anymore. For the next 22 years, John walked across the United States to raise environmental awareness. He did it for 17 years without talking. He got his PhD at the University of Wisconsin without talking. Okay. He said he started talking on Earth Day when he defended his dissertation. So now Exxon Valdez has happened in 1989. He's still only walking and taking non-motorized transport, but he, but he is talking. He's working on a friend's boat in New England. He gets a call from some folks in Washington, D.C. who said, you know, Exxon Valdez, we don't have anybody in this country who'd ever done a dissertation on oil spills except for John Francis. Will you come down and interview for this job so you can help us develop a plan to deal with oil spills? He said, sure, I'll come down. They were like, we'll send you a plane ticket. He said, I don't take a plane. We'll send you a bus ticket. I don't take a bus. We'll send you a train ticket. I don't take a train. How will you get here? I'll ride my bike. How long will that take? A month. They waited. He he rode his bike, he interviewed, he got the job. He's one of our really early, early architects around our oil spill policy. Um, John told me that when he was walking around and not talking that the folks in National Geographic approached him and wanted to tell a story about him. But a, a week later they changed their mind. And John kind of interpreted that as that they didn't want to do a story about a crazy black man who spent 22 years walking across the United States to raise environmental awareness 17 years without talking. Um, when he tried to, he decided he was going to publish a book um, about his experience in the early 2000s because he had started an organization called Planet Walk, the Planet Walker. He couldn't find anybody to publish it because we have so many stories about black men spending 22 years walking across the United States to raise environmental awareness 17 years without talking. Um, and he published it, but the National Geographic came around and saw that and decided, you know what, we'll publish that for you. And he became a National Geographic, you know, National Geographic Fellow. Hollywood has brought the rights to that story, which I'm really excited about because, ooh, if they get Idris Elba, I'm going to be there. <laughs> um, I really mean that. Um, um, and often when I say that, audience will, will say, well, Hollywood's going to mess it up. It shouldn't be uh, Hollywood doing the story. I said, it doesn't matter who does the story. When is the last time you've seen a film about a black man spending 22 years to walk across the United States to raise environmental awareness, 17 years without talking? I don't care who makes the movie. It will get people in the seat to see that kind of resilience and radical presence. Thank you. So I know I'm at the end. Oh, yeah, because I'm going to explode. Um, <laughs> I think the last thing that I want to say, see, this is why I should stay behind the podium. The last thing that I want to say, you all are so kind and gentle, um, is uh, I was thinking about just because the world may not see them doesn't mean they can't see the beauty of the world. The thing that I always want to impress over and over again, uh, what is common for human beings, I think what's common for myself and other human beings, is wanting to be seen, wanting to be whole, wanting to have a sense of belonging, wanting you to know that it's not about outreaching to me because you think I'm an empty vessel that you can put in new information, that actually I have dreams and I have spirit and I have ideas and I have a lived experience. And that if we come together, it's our differences together that will allow something new to emerge. So because I love Carl Sagan and because Mary Ellen Tucker brought Carl Sagan, I want to end with a short poem that I discovered because of Carl Sagan from his book Contact. And I don't know if you remember that book. I love that book. Um, and in the beginning, it's a short poem written by a young black child who was in fifth grade. Um, this was 1981, PS 153 in Harlem. My heart trembles like a poor leaf. 
The planets whirl in my dreams. The stars press against my window. I rotate in my sleep. My bed is a warm planet. Thank you. Carolyn, that's absolutely beautiful. Thank you. Oh, I made it. <laughs> yes. I'm uh, struck so much by uh, belonging in your words and uh, belonging to your story. One uh, can go a whole life long and never really find that capacity to really hold on to and belong and not just grasp, but to to discover, to know your own story in a new way. So I'm, st I'm struck by that. I'm, I'm asking you if you can comment on that uh, sense of what opens, what new ways of knowing open to a person when you belong to your own story. I love that you say that. And that's, for, you know, oftentimes, particularly, you know, one of the challenges I had within academia and in the social sciences, that there, there were those who didn't want me to tell my story and didn't want me to ask others, that wasn't the point. We, were, we have to take this larger theoretical 30,000 foot view of whatever the topic is. And in terms of the, the question of belonging, there are so many of us um, who've never felt like our story has any value, uh -huh. right? So in part, it's twofold for me. I tell my own story to, to open the door to say that everybody's story has value. So every, that's where we, that's for me where we can connect and nobody can tell you your story is wrong. Nobody, and you can tell it however you feel. Um, I also do it for myself. You know, um, I'm usually in rooms where there's, I'm the only one who looks like me. Um, and I think, well, how do I bring myself in the room? What is my responsibility to a story? I also tell this story because I'm adopted. You know, for me, in my experience of the world has been that we put a lot at stake in blood. And we make we even joke about people who are not blood related. I don't know who I'm related to. When I'm feeling really good and I'm generally a very optimistic person, I'm like, that means I can be related to everybody. <laughs> what about that? Uh -huh. And so there's something about um, the potential of a story also evolving over time mm. of, and having the chance to look back at it and <clears throat> things you didn't see before about it. You know, I think I've told, I tell that story a thousand times but I realize I'm always different each time I tell it. If that makes sense, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And much of this story that I'm hearing too is it's embedded in your person, it's at the center of your personal life, but it moves out into the larger world, the yes. community of life, the earth community. I've, the, uh, I feel like I've been gifted in so many ways and not the least of which is I have met so many incredible people who have shared their stories with me. I was sitting in the trailer of a Tuskegee Airman telling me his stories of working the land. I've met people I couldn't have imagined I would ever meet. And people who have also said to me, no one's ever asked me to tell my story yeah. before. And suddenly you, I, I felt empowered, like, I mean, like, who am I? But, you know, I'm giving them an opportunity. And I don't mean like, I don't mean that in any grandiose way. But their generosity of their story also allowed me to sort of take responsibility and ownership of the relationship and holding those stories sacredly together with my own. And that's the other reason I offer my own, because it's for me not fair to ask somebody else about their story if I'm not willing to share my own. Oh, lovely. Does Giving and holding. Please, sir, colleagues. Well, um, you are empowering, and thank you for a beautiful talk, but me to say, actually, um, my mother was adopted, and I didn't know that until I was already married. And I just learned wow. about 10 days ago that her family is from Kentucky. Wow. So I am related to you all. You got roots. You got right roots. Here. Yeah, the Dent family from yeah. Kentucky. Wow. Yeah. So anyway, beautiful, yeah. wonderful sense of where we belong. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think come, oh, go ahead. Go oh. ahead, please. Oh, well, what comes up for me, um, so what, what my spirit guides have said to me is, look, you guys, you can have this any way you want it. You can have it any way you want it. Do you know that? And right now you're saying you want it like this. 
So if this isn't really how you want it, then think it over, <laughs> you know? And so to me, that says that that paradigm is a choice, and uh, which is kind of a radical statement, but, but that's really what's being proposed. Paradigm is a choice. So I feel like really what's upon us right now is, is what paradigm do we want to choose? Mm -hmm. yes. I'm, I'm going to suggest the paradigm of thriving life. Mm -hmm. but, um, but what that then says is it, it creates um, camps about paradigm in a way, and that, and that can happen in family. Mm -hmm. So, you know, part of your family might be saying, no, we got to stay with the program, and you're crazy if you don't, mm -hmm. and, yeah. and, and I just think this is going to come up. So I just want to mm -hmm. put that out there for us to say that, you know, we're going to be being led and called in very different ways and in powerful ways, and people are being led in different directions, possibly, um, and, and, and I, I just want to offer that support to mm -hmm. say that, yes, I see that happening, I'm experiencing that as well. And that's that very powerful thing about the story of family loyalty. Oof. Really, <laughs> really, um, really going to come into play in these next years. And so gentleness, gentleness all the way around. And I love and support you in whatever that looks like for you. Beautiful. I think what I really liked about your not only talk, but also your perspective is that is giving off and the giving off of yourself. I think we become rich by giving, but not taking. And I think the moment you start sharing your ideas and your thoughts, actually it enriches all of us. And it really raises the tide so all boats can come up. So the people can actually talk to each other, communicate with each other, and share their personal um, you know, stories and personal perspective. And I think you know, in many cases we have kind of uh, often get fearful that I am this pure drop that came from the sky as a pure rain and then I am part of a nice river, and this river is going to fall into the ocean, and I will lose my identity. But I think if we stayed in that narrative, that paradigm, we isolate ourselves, and we become a puddle of water, which actually can breed only tadpoles and mosquitoes, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, not that they don't have their place. No, not, not that, there's, not that there's anything wrong with that either. <laughs> so, but I think at the end of the day, we sometimes have to lose that sense yeah. of really uh, immediate ownership and then become part of the ocean that can create really big waves and that whole life actually comes, comes together. So I think this whole panel discussion has really been very enriching for my personal self. I'm an neuroscientist, you know, I can tell you how brain cell fires, yes. but I think uh, my whole brain has been on fire because of this thing. Uh, <laughs> uh, nice. It's lovely. Yeah. It's a pathway then that sets our brain on fire and what better guide than woman stands shining to come <laughs> take us forward. Yes, take us home. <laughs> So we began with this one. I'm going to present this one again. Holy Mini wa chosen wa ka wopila ahiehe ahiehe ahiehe. Thank you for giving us life. Thank you for all that you are. We can't even know everything that you are. You're one of our highest elders. And thank you for the way that you bind all living things together as one family, the family of life. Also want to say thank you for the way that you connect us through time. Every single one of our ancestors in this room all had a drink of this very water. It's always been the same water. And all the ways of knowing and being, all of our ancestors who face similar time that we're facing right now, um, all their ceremony, all their prayer, they prayed into this water, and it's here with us. It's here with us. May this water continue on its journey uh, to the generations that are coming forward, to the ancestors to come, as we say. So I just want to say, Wopila. So after all these days, um, I'm feeling like really what, where we are in our 
<laughs> in our journey is we're on Vision Quest. Um, we're, you know, in, in the Lakota way, it's a very specific ceremony, and, we, and the word means that we're crying for a vision. That means that we, we submit ourselves in deepest humility to call upon the higher guidance that is available to us from earth, from spirit, um, from, from all dimensions, from all times, from our lineage and the lineage that's ahead of us. Um, and we present ourselves and we say, tell me what I need to know. And tell me how I can be of service. Tell me, tell me how to move forward. And so there was a song that was given to me uh, directly from Spirit um, in that way, and I'm, I want to sing that for us here. We hayo e haya, we haya huero heyo. Tonka shehila, on she malaya hero heyo. Tonka shehila, ho makia ye heyo. Tonka shehila, pila ho mayelo heyo. We ha yo e ha yo, we ha yo he ya we ro he yo. We ha yo e ha ya, we ha ya we ro he yo. We ha yo e ha ya, we ha ya we ro he yo. Un she makaina, makaki jelo yo he. She makaina ho makia ye he he yo. Um she makaina pila ho mayelo he he yo. We ha yo e ha yo, we ha yo he yo we ro he he yo. We ha yo e ha yo. We haya huero heyo. We hayo e haya. We haya huero heyo. Wambli glashka oyate chekia ye heyo. Wambli glashka oyate ho makia ye heyo. Wambli glashka oyate pila ho mayelo heyo. We hayo e haya. We hayo he ya huero heyo. We hayo e haya. We hayo huero heyo. We hayo e haya. We haya huero heyo. Tatanka oyatewa wa uero heyo. Tatanka oyatewa ho makia ye heyo. Tatanka oyatewa pila ho mayelo heyo. We hayo e haya, we hayo he ya huero e yo. We hayo e haya, we hayo huero he yo. We hayo e haya, we hayo huero he he yo. Tonka shehila ho makia ye he yo. Un she makaina ho makia ye he he yo. Wambli glashka oyate ho makia ye he he yo. Tatanka oyate wa ho makia ye. 
Hey, hey, oh. So, in the great gift that Creator sent to me, which was the Lakota way of spiritual way, spiritual view, spiritual way of life, spiritual practice, spiritual endowment. Um, it's so amazingly wise in about a million different ways. But one of the ways that I'm really noticing its wisdom is that it has ways of purposely bringing us to the very end of our own knowing and our own, the end of our own resource. It's a practice. Now in modern world, we are trained to believe that we are supposed to know <laughs> and you are supposed to be in control. As fictitious as that is for us over and over and over again. <laughs> And yet that's the pressure, right? And so what I, you know, in, in our spiritual practice, we fast. So we'll fast for four days. We'll fast with no food and no water. That's how we, that's actually how we go about this, this very humble crying for a vision in our lives. And there are other ceremonies that we do that are a little bit more physical than, than sitting on the earth also for four days without food and without water. And, and there's, it's actually humanly impossible. It cannot be done through will alone, through human strength alone. And so it's a practice that brings us right to that threshold where we have to meet our frailty, where we have to meet our limitation. Even the wisest elder among us is going to find that place quite quickly. And so when we, when we come to that place, there's, there's some pretty deep suffering that can occur. Until what we've been calling out for in unison, with the support of all of our families and relatives and friends, until what we've been calling out for comes to meet us. And when that comes to meet us, we are lifted. Present day, present time, present consciousness, as conscious as you can be in that situation. And suddenly you are held and you are lifted and you leave your own resource and enter into the vast greater resource. And that's what carries you through because it is a solemn commitment to complete these four days. It's the deepest of spiritual vows for us. So to place yourself over and over again in that position of knowing you will meet that place. So humbling. And I can't say that you, kn you know every time that that one is going to come and meet you. There's, for me anyway, there's always a question. Is this going to be the time when I fall and I can't get back up again? Is this going to be it? And so far, the answer has been no, not today, not this time. And I get lifted back up on my feet somehow, some way. And I'm helped to, to finish with my relatives who are also a part of holding each other up, who are also going through their own spiritual transformation of meeting that place, letting this one 
be <laughs> subdued long enough to reach out and to have all of this spiritual help come flooding in and literally lift your legs over and over again. Maybe for only one day, maybe it's only the fourth day, maybe it's the third and fourth day, sometimes it's the second, third, and fourth day. And we go into a, an actual uh, container of this energy, and when you're in there, after that has occurred, it's like flying. It's a spiritual euphoria but you could only be in there for a couple of hours before you have to come out and rest again. And every time you come out and rest again and you lay down with all your exhausted, <laughs> wonderful relatives, the pain of your physical human body and experience comes back again. And so on some level, you have to go through that process every single time you head back out. This is very sacred knowledge. <laughs> but I'm speaking it here as a way of expressing how I see where we are headed. We may come to the end of our knowing. In fact, I think it is guaranteed we will come to the end of our knowing. The elders that I trust, because they can determine what the weather is gonna be for the next two weeks by watching the way the raven flies, They said we had 10 years to make a radical new collective decision. And that was five years ago. So I don't know about this decades business. We don't know. Let's face it, we don't know. But what I wanna propose to us is this. Not knowing is not the same as the end of the world. <laughs> Not knowing is not the same as the end of the world. Not knowing and coming to the end of our own resource might be the most powerful thing that has ever happened to us. Not knowing and coming to the end of our own resource might turn out to be the most beautiful time of our life. And part of the way that can happen is by calling upon whatever that faith is that you have, the ethics that it speaks to about how we treat each other and how we treat ourselves in that moment. Let that be our guide. Let that be our guide. We are beloved. You are beloved. You are the beautiful, beloved, celebrated, nurtured, nourished, precious child of creator, of creation, of the holy people, of this mother earth, of all of our relations, flying ones, swimming ones, creepy crawling ones, four-legged ones, they're rooting for us. So the last piece of that community is who? <laughs> it's us. How can we make each other the beautiful, beloved, celebrated, nurtured, nourished, beloved brother and sister that we witness in each other? in all the deep questions that arise, in all that we are asked to bring forth, in all that we are asked to relinquish, and we will be asked to relinquish that which we may have been taught we must never relinquish for our own personal well-being. Your retirement may not come in cash. In fact, I'm gonna guess it's not going to. That's okay. 
Let your retirement be your community. Let your retirement be your connection to younger generations. As one of the elders says, this can be a beautiful time. I was told that all of us were sent here with spiritual help swarming around us. And it can do nothing for us until we ask, because that's the law. So together with all of us, and in this, in this room and beyond, whoever's watching, and in the days that come after we leave here, let's ask. Let's ask. Let's see what love will come to meet us in this hour of our not knowing. and your words echo in all of our hearts, I hope. Um, I'm very moved by the lesson you've given us to, to correct an image that's been imposed upon Native peoples for so long, crying for vision, and the imaging of crying at the end, the trail of tears, the end of uh, the journey, you know, the sense of a, a failed people, a failed uh, civilization or whatnot, that you're uh, leading us into an understanding of crying for vision just wipes that off the table. Because what you've given us is a sense of the uh, taking responsibility and the trial and the, re the, the, the difficulty of taking that responsibility. I wanted to just cast it this way. Early on when we began, I asked Mary Evelyn about dream, and I know in all these traditions, especially native traditions, dreams are their own revelatory capacity, but can you hear where she's taken us? Crying for vision is different. You're taking hold of yourself and bringing yourself into this place, and it, uh, it opens up a knowing. It opens up a new way of knowing that's generated by a self-commitment, this crying for a vision, humble cheapi, really opening oneself for a vision. So I, I wanted to just ask you a bit more about this, what opens, what, what that knowing is that's so deeply sensory, it's so deeply emotional, and yet it has the character of knowing, what we call reason, but reason falls so short. It's a, it's a knowing of the heart in what you've presented to us. That's a very hard thing to describe. <laughs> um, so this brings up something that I've been thinking about over the days, which is that, um, you know, uh, even in, in my culture, and I think in other cultures, this idea of, uh, or this, this way of conceptualizing these events. So the old people say, They'd be, they wouldn't even let you get that far, right? They'd be like, <laughs> right? <laughs> because, because there is, you know, as soon as everything, as soon as all of that, whatever that is, <laughs> moves up here, uh. um, it, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a disconnect happens and there's a, a loss of, of power, actually. There's a loss of that spiritual blessing in, in some ways. And, and I feel like in all of the faith traditions, we are at a point where we, where we, I'm going to say, we, we all need, that's a big statement, we all need to go back to that place that is almost beyond words, that, we, that is within our faith. It's why our faiths have been carried forward all this time, because it was such a phenomenon to our ancestors that they safeguarded it. They safeguarded that, that encounter. They safeguarded that that, that power that, 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 that can hardly be expressed and, and conceptualized. And so once that, you know, as I talked about on my very first day, <laughs> once that academic or that, that singular way of knowing of the intellect came and, and literally was spread across the world, was imposed over humanity in every place on the planet, um, then we began to start to translate that fire 
that experience, that encounter, that spontaneous combustion into co concept. Mm. And I'm noticing that even within my own culture, you know, as w you know, we have been, uh, we went through a period of being outraged of, of how anthropologists were trying to dis describe us to the world when, they, when their worldview was so different that they couldn't possibly understand what they were seeing. And yet they were saying, well, these people are this, this, and this. So when we went in, we, when we came into a place, you know, our, our spiritual way of life wasn't legalized until I think it was, what, 1972, huh? Yes. Very late in the game. <laughs> um, but but when, we, when we came to that, to that, to that place and, and beyond, you know, and we started entering into the universities, um, uh, we wanted to explain ourselves to the world, but we started doing it through that academic lens. And so what I feel like, you know, even my culture is endangering, is endangering itself of, is conceptualizing what we are. And um, at that point, we begin, we begin to, to lose something so powerful. And so I'm uh, putting, putting that out there, and, and I think, you know, our, our, our spiritual way of life, I, I was going to say religion, but I'm going to edge it over just a little bit. You know, it's not, it's not a written thing. So I don't know what these uh, deep religious practices do once they commit those, those very holy occurrences to paper and to the, to the written way, but I know that what caused them to be written and, and to be written on special paper and to be presented in a very special way was because of what actually happened in the spirit, in the body, in the heart, long before it ever came up to here. So I, I call on us to, to go back and find that place because it's not, you know, people will, that I'm around sometimes will joke and say, well, that's like Old Testament stuff, right? That used to happen back then. No, 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 no. It's alive here. It's always been alive here. And it's alive right now. Mm. Oh, please. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> yes, yeah, so catching up fast. So I was, um, first of all, thank you for sharing all that. There's um, a woman who's an elder and somebody I've known for 30 years, and so much she's, um, her experience of being black and Lakota, and she used so much of the same language, talk, you know, the idea of the great mystery, and trying to get me to think about, you know, to relinquish, you know, this, enough so that I, which means that I have to trust that which I cannot see, feel, define, that it's going to actually be there for me. Um, I was thinking about a couple of different things when you mentioned academia and the way that, not to demonize academia, but the idea that to intellectualize the world has been privileged as the way and the right way to understand what's going on in the world um, and how for me when I think about the way we think about difference and diversity, and we say that that's what we want to bring in, but yet what, we were, what I find is that we're actually asking it to assimilate to what already exists, as opposed to making space for anything that's new. Um, I'm thinking of, yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking about the idea of taking a risk in order to gain, as opposed to taking a risk in order not to lose, which is also, for me, when I, what I, how I interpret some of what you're saying for myself is that, you know, again, how do you step into the I don't know? And some of that is about practice. Some of that is about intention. Some of that is about relationship. When you said, I couldn't believe you said the same thing as Kaylin when you said this idea that your retirement is your relationships. And she says it to me all the time. She's in her 70s. She says, my social security is my relationships. It's not about money. And that kind of blew my, when I really understood that, my fears about I'm not going to have enough to pay the rent or all of these things. But the idea, if I put my faith in my relationships, and my work there, I will be okay going into the I don't know. Sorry, you, you, there was a lot going on. I don't want to take it up, but that was deep. I think I'll start, you know, great talk, really enjoyed it. But, you know, as they say that money cannot buy everything, but I just need the opportunity to test this hypothesis. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's... That, that aside, actually, uh, being, a, being a neuroscientist, I should really defend the brain. But when I pulled my religious card 
Actually, in Quran, heart is described as seat of intellect. And because it actually provides the blood to the brain, and without it, brain cannot really function at all. So the tribute is really paid to the giver, which is the source of really everything that the brain does. So when we say in, um, in Islam, Bismillah rahman rahim I begin in the name of God, you know, most merciful and beneficent. Mm. Um, rahman and Rahim in Arabic means more or less the same thing, but Rahim comes from womb of the mother. So God says the way mother nurtures and nourishes a baby without baby having any senses or the needs or desires, this is how I provide, right? And then the rest of the part is, is fatherly love. So you have to really make the effort to go up. So because heart really provides the blood to the brain, without it, it doesn't function. I think that's where we connected at the heart level. And I think that's a lot easier because the conscious is individual to individual people and we all have different consciences. But I think heart, which is the, really the sinoatrial node, is common in all of us. So, thank you. Um, you know, Confucianism, the heart and mind are one. Yes. They're one character. So, when I left, in the 60s and went to Japan to teach there. It was a great relief <laughs> because there was this integration um, where people would say, I've been thinking about this, you know? <laughs> and, <laughs> um, and so I think your invitation to feel and think and cry and call, you know, in a, in a magnificent path mm -hmm. is so powerful. And I just wanted to, maybe give a shout out to what's happening here in Louisville too. You know, there's an Earth and Spirit Center that's trying to put this together. Joe Mitchell, this wonderful director. Mm. Uh, you know, that's, and that's in, been inspired by Thomas Berry and so on, because Joe's a passionist priest. Um, and there's a, another wonderful Tibetan center doing meditation. And I wanted to also just mention Lisa Miller, who's trying to help people understand as young people without this integration. And her book, The Spiritual Child, is I think very much in line with this. But I want to thank you for your presence, your integration, and that deep sense we are at a non-knowing. And that is also a great gift. So thank you for bringing us to that path. Thank you. It's wonderful to, uh, to listen to the uh, conversation on uh, cosmology and worldview. Uh, it, it, it's not been at 30,000 feet, has it? I, we've, uh, we danced in the story, and we had a good sense of laughter, and you nested us in all of these circles going out. and. Uh, we sang together, we sang through you. But you uh, taught, brought us to water mm -hmm. before we sang. And you brought us to water in that ancestral presence too. All of our ancestors drank from this water. It flows all around us and through us. And it's uh, in uh, Taoist tradition especially that I find that sense of water and letting go. And I feel that a lot in, in where you've brought us to the the capacity to let go is not simply a conceptual act. It's a, it's a crying out. It's so, in some ways I feel so foreign to us to finally reach a, a letting go. It's not, we're driven creatures. We're, we're mammals who um, fight to survive and we learn how to play and reach out, but somehow it's that deep letting go which is still such a challenge. And for traditions to have come to an understanding of this is uh, it's profound. Eh? 